Okay. I'm on. That's a good start. Uh, I'm just going to read a short passage from Romans to start us off. But just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Man, it's been a while since I've done this. Um, according to the files on my computer, which may be slightly incomplete, I think there might be one or two that I never got to putting on there. I haven't delivered the message at a church service since early 2005. It was a while ago. Um, and gave a couple at Port Kennedy. And before that, there was a dozen or so, mostly around 1998, 2000. So I may have had enough of a break by now. Maybe. Um, so when I'm writing a sermon, I generally what I do is I take something that God's already been putting on my heart, and I sort of amplify it and pull it apart a bit and discuss it. So the downside of that is in 15 minutes or so, you all are going to know a lot more about my weaknesses and my failures than you know right now. That's not a comfortable thought, but that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is, when I started writing up my thoughts to put together into this message, one of the first things I did was go back and read all my other sermons. Now, it wasn't procrastinating, it was um, spiritual preparation, right? Yeah, okay, I was procrastinating. Um, and it turns out I've spoken on more or less this same topic three times already, out of, you know, under 20 sermons, that's a pretty high ratio. That's not the bad part yet. I can promise you, I'm not just dusting off the old ones. I'm not even stealing from them. I have written this one from scratch. Although, uh, going back, it turns out I am saying some of the same things in the same way. But the bad part is, I think the other ones were better. <laughs> Nevertheless, this is one you're getting. If it's really disappointing, come to me afterwards, hit me up. I can send you the other ones. Okay, so what I want to tell you today is get involved. The first thing is, why should we get involved? First, and most simply, the nature of our relationship with God demands it. It's easy to call Jesus our Lord, but what does that mean? It's the role of a servant to do the work his master has given him to do. So if Jesus is truly our Lord, we need to be doing his work. Ephesians 2 verse 10 tells us, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, in my team at work, we've had a few vacancies. Um, the beginning of the year, one employee went on maternity leave. Can't really blame her for that. Um, another one left a month or so ago. Um, and this is all happening while we're actually trying to ramp up, because we've got some major projects coming up. So we're actually trying to expand and people keep leaving. And we've been trying to fill three positions. And then Thursday, two days ago, another guy put in his resignation. So now we've got to advertise for a fourth position. Uh, incidentally, you know, if anyone's got business intelligence uh, experience, uh, data science, you know, talk to me afterwards. Um, and I can tell you that in the position descriptions we're putting out, it doesn't say, All right, this is the list of the things we want you to do. But, you know, we figure that's only going to take about 20 hours a week. The rest of the time, you know, do what you like. In fact, we all recently had to review our employee agreements because they made some changes to the general terms and conditions. This is the first thing it says under general duties. The employee must devote all of the employee's time, attention and skill to the performance of the employee's duties, both during normal business hours and at other times as reasonably necessary. Now, Jesus demands the same from us except not just in business hours. Here's a passage from Luke 9. Jesus said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, 
but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And still another said to him, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not going to unpack that one today, but it is clear that Jesus is not interested in being our second priority. In fact, we could even say he doesn't want to be just our first priority. He wants to be our only priority. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength, not with some of it, not until you feel like you've done enough, but with everything you have and everything you are. Secondly, we need to get involved because we are all members of one body. Each of us has our own designated function and all of us are dependent on each other to perform those functions. Just as our own bodies have serious health problems if some of our organs or glands are out of kilter or not working properly, so too the body of Christ, which is the church, cannot function at its peak if some of the parts are not doing their job. We saw from the reading in Romans that each of us has been given the gifts we need to do the work that God intends for us. And Paul says that whatever that gift is, we are to be using it. I did look, just in case, but I couldn't see any part that said, if your gift is enjoying the fellowship of the church, then come along every week, join in the singing, talk to some people, have a cuppa, then you're good to go. It doesn't say that. Not that any of those are bad things, but there is no spiritual gift of just turning up. God has designed each of us for more, and he expects us to do more. There is no excuse. Even if you're incapable, physically incapable of being involved in most things, the reality is it is easier now to connect with people remotely than ever before. We've all experienced that in the last year. And that, so there are still opportunities for you to reach out into other people's lives. And certainly, you can still be involved in prayer ministry. And not that prayer ministry is a last resort, because the ministry of prayer is one of the most vital ones in any fellowship of believers. Now, I have some bad news at this point. Even if you're already involved in some aspect of service, it doesn't mean you get a free pass here. God doesn't wait for us to have a certain amount of free time before he calls us. And I think the reason for that is pretty obvious. If he did, we'd all somehow find we never had quite enough free time. And we wouldn't commit to what it is that God wants of us. So if you're doing something that lets you get into a comfortable routine, so you're contributing, but it doesn't really demand too much of you, then look out. If you're just coasting, you need to start asking God what else he has in mind for you. God isn't interested in creating comfortable Christians or complacent Christians or casual Christians. The truth is, if we let God work in our lives, we will find that each of us has been continually shaped and formed and trained for service. This isn't a process that stops once we've reached an acceptable level. It lasts all our lives as God continually calls us to move forward, to grow to become higher and better and stronger in him than we ever have been before and therefore be able to do more than we ever could before. Ephesians 4 tells us that we are being prepared for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. When we send our kids to school, like when they just start school, pre-primary, year one, they get taught the basics, letters, numbers, colours, shapes, basic rules of behaviour. Don't hit the kid next to you even if you really want to. Not looking at my kids particularly here. <laughs> okay, so when they've learned those, do we say, okay, great job, you've learned the things we wanted you to learn, well done, your education is complete, now you can go out into the world. Of course we don't. Instead we say, well done, now it's time to go on to more complicated things. As their abilities increase, they move on from letters to words, and from numbers to counting, and then we start teaching them spelling and arithmetic and grammar and geometry and analysis and calculus. 
In the same way, once we've been trained to one level of service, God calls us on to the next. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to be full on all the time. God doesn't want us to burn ourselves out. The reason God wants our total commitment is because of his perfect love for us. He knows when we need to rest, and he will call us to rest when we need it. But I have to say, I think there are far more of us resting more than we need to than there are not resting enough. It's very easy to let our own impulse to laziness convince us that we need to be resting when God is urging us to do something. So we are maybe a bit reluctantly convinced that we need to be doing some work as a member of the body of Christ. How do we approach it? The biggest and most important thing I have to say on this is don't limit yourself. Don't be bound by your own inadequacies. Don't avoid something because it's frightening or you don't think you can do it. Now, we all tend to look at things in terms of what we know we can do. We're comfortable relying on our own skills and experience. But we're less comfortable relying on God. And I think fundamentally this comes down to a question of trust. When we really get right down to it, we don't really trust God to look out for us. And one of the reasons is, by that, we often mean we don't trust God to keep life comfortable for us. We suspect, rightfully, that God is wanting us going to want us to go beyond the things we're comfortable with. And we're scared by the prospect because we don't have a fallback plan. But if we rely on ourselves, we're not growing spiritually. In fact, we're going backwards because we're reinforcing that habit of turning to ourselves and not turning to God. God doesn't want to be just our emergency contact where we go through life in our own strength and then turn to him whenever we come up against something we can't cope with. His love for us is fierce and eternal. We've heard that a few times over the last few weeks. And he wants us to love and trust him back. And if we do trust him enough to rely on him rather than our own strength, he will use us to do things that we could not do on our own. I was at the Aspire Men's Conference a month ago, along with a few other people here. One of the po points that was brought out there was that men are particularly reluctant to show weakness. And this leads to problems because they don't ask for help when they need it. But we mustn't be afraid to display our weaknesses. God tells us that he will supply whatever we lack. God says, my power is made perfect in weakness because when God, God operates through us in our weakness, his power and strength is displayed for all to see. Moreover, this is one of the ways in which Satan will try to attack us. He'll try to convince us that whatever it is we're contemplating doing, it's too far beyond us and we shouldn't even try it. Someone else would surely do a better job of it, so we should just leave it to them. Now, there's two problems with this. One of them is pretty obvious. If you're thinking, I'll leave it to that person, and that person's thinking, oh, I'll leave it to someone else, if everyone's thinking they'll leave it to someone else, nothing's going to get done. But there's another problem as well. If God is calling you to do something, are you telling him he's making a mistake? If you are, you are in good company. Moses had exactly the same reaction. So God took him through a trial run of the miracles he wanted him to perform. He promised he would help Moses speak and give him to the words to say. And what did Moses say? Please, Lord, send someone else. <laughs> but God says, you are the one I have chosen for this work. In the New Testament, when Ananias was sent to heal Saul's sight, he basically said to God, are you sure about this? You know, this guy's the one that's been persecuting all the believers. You want me to go and heal him? And God said, this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles. God isn't looking for professionals. When Jesus called his disciples, he didn't go looking in the temples or he didn't go and talk to all the scholars. He called a bunch of fishermen and a tax collector. And the truth is that to be involved in the various ministries of our church, you don't need a degree. I would wager that most of the things we do don't even need any more than 15 minutes of training, maybe half an hour if it's one of the more complicated jobs. Maybe you have to do safe church. That's probably about it for most of our work. And if God is calling you to one of the exceptions that does require specialised training, I'm pretty sure something can be arranged. So don't let your fears stop you. 
Second Timothy tells us God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. We need to learn to rest in God's strength and not rely on our own. And here's the thing. If we stop trying to do things in our own strength, the work actually becomes easier because we're relying on God's power to do it. This is why Jesus says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. C.S. Lewis wrote in the book Mere Christianity, which I recommend to everyone, it's a great book, the terrible thing, the almost impossible thing, is to hand over your whole self, all your wishes and precautions to Christ. But it is far easier than what we're all trying to do instead. For what we're trying to do is to remain what we call ourselves, to keep personal happiness as our great aim in life, and yet at the same time be good. We are all trying to let our mind and our heart go their own way, centred on money or pleasure or ambition, and hoping in spite of this to behave honestly and chastely and humbly. And that is exactly what Christ warned us you could not do. Finally, don't delay. Now, I have to admit, this point particularly is going to make me sound hypocritical because when this came up to me, I did exactly the opposite of what I'm telling you. Hopefully you can do better than I have, all right? Once you've decided that you will go forward with the work that God's calling you to, you can expect the next thing the devil will suggest is you should just wait a little bit longer until you're really sure about it. And he will keep you dithering about it as long as he possibly can. So don't let him. Don't wait to be asked. Once you've decided to serve, go ahead and start. By the same token, if you're leading a ministry and you have someone in mind who you think could make a contribution, don't hesitate to ask them because that might be the final push they need to start doing what God's been calling them to do. So how do we know what it is that God's calling us to do? Like most things in the Christian life, the answer to this one starts with staying close to God, like prayer and reading his word, the Bible. These disciplines are really the foundation of everything that we do. Examine the gifts that God has given you and consider how you can use them. He's given them to you for a reason. Spend time with God, ask him to lead you, and he will make it known to you. But in the meantime, open your eyes and look around you. There are needs everywhere. Now, I haven't rehearsed this bit. We'll see how it goes. Anyone who's a ministry leader in the church or puts together a roster, organises people to do something, can you stand up, please? That's not many people standing up, but we'll see how we go. Yep. Yeah, you can, you can stand up. <laughs> Yeah, if, you, if you're leading or organising anything in the church, I want you standing up. I can see a few people being encouraged to stand up. <laughs> okay, so with the ministries that you're involved in, quick show of hands, how many of them are amply provided, you don't need any help? If someone came to you and said, look, I want to help, said, well, I don't really have anything for you to do. No one. How many of you are you're managing okay, but you could, you could always use a bit more help? Hands? Okay. And how many are sort of scraping along, but you really do need more people? And how many are desperate for more help and you don't know if you can continue without it? All right. So we've got a couple of those. Now, everyone else who's not standing up, you know who to go and talk to after this. All right, you can have a seat, thank you. There are also plenty of opportunities out in the community. One of the things Jesus said was that we will always have the poor with us, and looking after those who can't support themselves is a major feature of Scripture. This is something else that C.S. Lewis writes. Some people nowadays say that charity ought to be unnecessary, and that instead of giving to the poor, we ought to be producing a society in which there were no poor to give to. They may be quite right in saying that we ought to produce this kind of society. But if anyone thinks that, as a consequence, you can stop giving in the meantime, then he has parted company with all Christian morality. I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid that the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common 
among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charity's expenditure excludes them. Particular cases of distress among your own relatives, friends, neighbours or employees, which God, as it were, forces on your notice, may demand much more, even to the crippling and endangering of your own position. For many of us, the great obstacle to charity lies not in our luxurious living or our desire for more money, but in our fear, fear of insecurity. And Julie also, during the week, pointed me to an item in Global Interactions newsfeed, uh, where Scott Pilgrim, the executive director, talks about a couple that he'd been talking with who were considering service with Global Interaction. And they said something which struck him. They said, we were exploring opportunities for the future, which was exciting, but we suddenly realised that we were missing out on serving God in the here and now. We were missing present, everyday opportunities. And Scott Pilgrim goes on to quote um, Clive Meador in Discovering the Mission of God, Best Missional Practices for the 21st Century, it is not unusual for believers to see their current place in life simply as preparation for the future, without realising how God wants to use them now. Your current situation, however, is never merely preparation for some other time yet to come. God has a purpose and a plan for each of us at every moment. Mission is God's task. The most important task for you is whatever he calls and directs you to do. Every element, every place, Every act of service and every witness is important and is service to him. It's important to ensure that the service we are doing is the service that God has called us to. I have a condition called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. You may know it, probably not, unless you've got it yourself, in which the immune system decides that the thyroid gland is an enemy and it attacks it until bit by bit it kills it off. So, don't worry, it just means I have to take tablets every day to replace what my thyroid can no longer produce. The immune system can often be a bit of an overachiever, as anyone with allergies or hay fever or eczema knows all too well. It's not deliberately setting out to cause trouble, it's just trying to do its job. But the net effect is detrimental to the body. And so it is with us. It's easy to turn away from a daunting service to pursue an easier one. And you can be sure that if we think of that, Satan will be telling us, yeah, that's a great idea. If we're trying to serve God, but we're not doing the service that God is actually calling us to, we would be less effective at building up the body of Christ and less of a witness to others. I said before that God doesn't want complacent or casual Christians. So what does God want from us? God wants us to be confident, not in our own abilities, but in God's faithfulness, his ability to use us, and his power to compensate for all of our deficiencies. God wants us to be compassionate and caring, not closed off from our community, but aware of and responding to the needs that are all around us. God wants us to be continually growing in our faith, in our reliance on him, and in our service, so that we can reach full maturity in Christ. And above all, God wants us to be committed Christians, dedicated to following Jesus in whatever he calls us to, as our highest and only priority, to truly give our whole lives to him, holding nothing back. Let's pray. Dear Lord, it's hard for us to surrender. It's hard for us to stop holding back. Please help us to submit ourselves to your will. Encourage us and fortify us against the attacks of the enemy. Help us to connect with those around us and open our eyes to the opportunities we have in the here and now. And help us to remember that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. In the precious name of Jesus.